Joshua chapter 20. Just want to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20. I reached a milestone this week. Uh, September 1st, which was Friday, marked uh, my 55th spiritual birthday. And uh, different ones in my family and others who knew about that just wanted a quick sentence or two recap. And I said, well, you know, on the day I texted this to different ones on Friday, I said, uh, 55 years ago yesterday, which would have been August 31st, 1962, I was drunk out of my mind and on my way to entering absent without leave from the Navy. And then less than 24 hours later, I'd given my heart to the Lord. I thought, what a difference. 24 hours or less can make in a life. And uh, I don't know whether it's you that said it, but I know I've said it from time to time. We have uh, some of the guys in the mission picked it up from their pastor that they have, and and when they share with the guys, they'll sit, they'll talk about the 10, 15, 20 seconds that could change your life. And then the guys sit there with a blank look on their face and they said any of you who, who can count or have a watch count how many seconds it takes me to say this and then they just you know like I do I'll say uh, Lord I never do another thing in my life I want to know that I'm on my way to heaven come into my life and take over one fellow said not all that long ago when one of the guys did something similar he says Gosh, it only took 20 seconds. And the fellow said, that's 20 seconds that can change your life. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. So, Judges chapter 20. Um, we've previously mentioned, and I want to mention this again, that the events recorded in this last five chapters, and we'll, finish, we'll probably finish up with the book of Judges next week. Okay, and uh, they actually, those events actually occurred, like we mentioned early on in the uh, period of the Judges. Uh, and then we have in those chapters 17, 18, and 19, the sin of, of a man named Micah in setting up an ungodly shrine. And then the sin of a Levite in being party or being kind of cashing in with the establishing of a false priesthood and, and it has a result that brought about some horrible stuff. And then as we also mentioned last week, it would be hard to find a uh, darker or more depressing episode in the whole Old Testament story of God's people than the account of this civil war in Israel that takes place with, with most of the Israelites and the tribe of Benjamin. And certainly there were many dark moments to come later when the armies of Assyria and then Babylon, for example, swept the nation into exile. But like I mentioned last week, this appalling self-inflicted genocide with 40,000 Israelites cut down in the first two days of the battle and then 25,100 Benjamites on the final decisive day it's, it's just a massacre that took place amongst common people. Common people. Amongst brothers and sisters of, uh, of the Israelites. And it's no wonder, I mentioned last week as well, that the survivors of the catastrophe are to be found weeping before God. And, and, and they say, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass? in Israel. And then as we 
mentioned last week, the answer is the story of the book of Judges, and we've seen that. The sins of idolatry and immorality always lead, in the end, to self-destruction. And we got to... Um, we got to draw, you, you need to make sure, folks, when you read the Word and study the Word, that you draw an application. We emphasize this so much to the guys up at the mission when they give their, what we call the soap presentations, where it's Scripture, S, Scripture, O, observation, what does it say? Application, what does it say to me? And then based upon all of that, then they they write out a prayer and then they say that and pray that, you know, for the before the group. And those of you who've been up there and witnessed a soul presentation know what I'm talking about. But there always has to be, there must be an application. And sometimes it we have to look really deep to find one. But that's to me that's the joy of of studying the scriptures. Say, okay Lord What's this say to me? What's it saying to me today? Paul wrote in the New Testament. He says the things that were written beforehand or long ago were written for our instruction. So we need to get the application. So that's the, the story of the book of Judges. The sins of idolatry and immorality always lead in the end to self-destruction. And the spreading infection of godlessness eventually surfaced in Sexual immorality, we saw that. Personal violence, we saw that. Moral paralysis, we saw that. And the whole process comes to its inevitable and depressing climax in the determination of the 11 tribes to punish their erring, E-R-R-I-N-G, brother Benjamin. So what was the sin or the erring, E-R-R-I-N-G, or the sin of the tribe of Benjamin. What was it? Well, it was their wickedness in the city of Gibeah. Remember that, the homosexuality behavior? And, and that was not the only thing that they involved themselves with. It was idol worship of every kind. I mean, it was an ungodly place. And, and then when, it, when this stuff was brought to their attention, they they had an unwillingness to do anything about it. And when God brings something to our attention, I mentioned this last week, and this again by way of application, when God brings something to our attention, especially the sin in our lives, we just need to take care of it. We need to take care of it. And don't delay. And so the outcome of their unwillingness to do anything about it is a civil war which almost, and this was sad, almost totally wipes out one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Almost totally wipes them out. And the aim to this civil war and having this is, start, is stated in verse 13 of chapter 20 where it says partially to remove the evil from Israel. So that was the goal, to remove the, the evil from Israel. And the reason for the call to war was that was what took place with the ungodly Levite and his concubine. That was, and we're familiar with that. Okay. Now, the two sides prepared for battle. And there was a clear, there was clearly a dis, disparity in the alignment of the sides. 26,700 Benjamites up against 400,000 men of Israel. And prior to the battle, the Israelites went up to Bethel to inquire the, of the Lord concerning who would be the first to venture, to venture into battle against the Benjamites. Now, although the tabernacle was at Shiloh, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God's presence among his people, the Ark of the Covenant was sometimes transported into battle. And so to avoid the trip northward to Shiloh, the, the ark was brought down to Bethel, only five miles north of this area, uh, Mizpah. And in response to their inquiry um, to the Lord, the Lord instructed them to send Judah 
into battle first. Someone asked me the question last week after we had the teaching here on Sunday morning. They said, why Judah? Why was Judah? Well, Judah may have been chosen because their territory was right next to Benjamin. And they would have been familiar with the terrain because they had similar terrain. And the men of Judah proceeded in battle formation against the Benjamites. And in the encounter, 22,000 Israelites were killed. And then as a result, the Israelites went up to the ark of the Lord and they wept. Verse 23 of chapter 20. Then the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I again draw near for battle against the children of my brother Benjamin? And I mentioned to you, you know, um, I enjoy, although I don't make a habit of it, I enjoy speculating as to what might be someone's thinking when they do something or you know, in the scriptures even, do something or ask the Lord for something. And like I mentioned to you last week and I think the week before when we talked about this stuff is the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat convinced that when they went up and, and said, shall I again draw near for battle against the children of my brother Benjamin? I'm thinking, they're hoping that God said, no, don't do that, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. And sometimes... I know I do that. I don't like, I don't like confrontation. I don't. Can't stand it. I will get involved with it if I need to. And uh, so <clears throat> sometimes I say, Lord, I don't want to confront this situation. I don't want to confront these people. Will you please take care of it? Understand what I'm saying? And sometimes God does and we go, Ooh, hallelujah. And sometimes he doesn't. And and we go, oh me, I, I got to do something. So we wade into it. So they inquired of the Lord. He again sent them into the battle and they took up, the, up their battle positions once more. Verse 22. Okay, of chapter 20. And then on the second day of battle, the, the Benjamites inflicted further losses on the Israelites as 18,000 men of Israel fell in that battle. We mentioned that last week. And so then the contrite attitude of the Israelites is noteworthy in this situation. And we mentioned this last week. Uh, they went up to Bethel where they wept, they fasted, and offered burnt offerings and, and fellowship offerings. Both were voluntary offerings and the burnt offering was a Oh, was kind of a consecration offering that signified complete surrender to God. And while the, the fellowship offering signified communion with the Lord, that was the, that was the uh, purpose of that fellowship offering as such when they did that. Huh? I'm right around verse, uh, well, right around 22, 23, right in that area. And I'm just kind of, doing some recapping here from last week. While, and while the, the reason for the two defeats that the Israelites faced against the Benjamites, it's, it's really not stated. But I inferred something last week and, and then I came across something that uh, kind of cashed in with what I said, not not that, you know, that was all that great, but the thing was, uh, and I'm quoting here, the congregation now discovered from this repeated defeat that the Lord had, with, had withdrawn his grace, grace and was punishing them or chastising them. Their sin was their strong self-consciousness and great confidence in their own might and power because they, com they completely outnumbered the Benjamites. You got that? But they had indeed inquired of God who should open the conflict, but they had neglected, and here I mentioned this last week, they had neglected to humble themselves before Jehovah God, the covenant God. And uh, 
in the consciousness, they needed to be conscious of the fact that their own weakness and sinfulness was, was great, but also they had to be consciousness of the grief and the moral corruption of the Benjamites. And with the two defeats that they'd already faced at the hands of the Benjamites, I don't think they, 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 they realized that. And so once more, the Israelites then inquired of the Lord whether they were to go to war against the Benjamites. And that's in verse 28. Uh, where they says, well, action 28. Yeah, and Phineas, the son of Ele Eleazar, he's the high priest at this point, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days saying, shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? And... The Lord said, go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. And that's, that's where we kind of wound up last week. But that gives us a quick recap of bringing us up to date on what's going on. So let's look at verses uh, 29 through the first part of 32. Then Israel, we're, we're in chapter 20, Nancy, verse 29. Then Israel sat men in ambush all around Gibeah. And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day and put themselves in battle array against Gibeah as at the other times. So the children of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city. They began to strike down and kill some of the people as at the other times in the highways, one of which goes up to Bethel and the other to Gibeah. And in the field, about 30 men of Israel. And the children of Benjamin said, they are defeated before us as at the first. So since Israel had been repulsed or rebuffed by two direct attacks on Gibeah, they decided on a change of strategy. And so what they did, they, they set up an ambush similar to Joshua's strategy for the conquest of Ai. Remember that one? That was way back when. That's in Joshua chapter chapters, chapter 8, verses 4 to 29, if you want to go back and recap that. We talked about that way back when. It seems like 100 years ago, but it hadn't been quite that long. Um, and so uh, Ahai at that time was a main force of Israelites, and they had, uh, well, in this situation right here, we're talking about this current situation. So a main force of Israelites advanced on Gibeah, lured the Jim Benjamites out of the city while a contingent lay in wait behind the city. So that's what's going to take place here. The Israelites purposely retreated as the Benjamites attacked, causing the attackers to leave their city behind in their pursuit of the fleeing Israelites. And this strategy caused the Benjamites to kind of rethink or think they were again victorious as they killed 30 men in the open field and on the roads leading north to Bethel and Gibeah. So let's look at that. So uh, verse 32, last part of it. Um, so the children of Benjamin went out against the people, were drawn away from the city. They began to strike down and kill some of the people as at the other times in the highways, one of which goes up to Bethel and the other to Gibeah and in the field about 30 men of Israel. And the children of Benjamin, I'm repeating here, said, they are defeated before us as at first. But the children of Israel said, let us flee and draw them away from the city to the highways. See what's happening here? We're gonna have some deception and a plan. I love it. So all the men of Israel rose from their place and put themselves in battle array at Bahal Tamar. Then Israel's men in ambush burst forth from their positions in the plain of Gibeah. And 10,000 select men from all Israel came against Gibeah, and the battle was fierce. But the Benjamites did not know that disaster was upon them. So both the deception and the strategy are seen in right there in verse 32 where they say okay we're gonna we're gonna plan a plan an ambush 
They, the deceived Benjamites thought that, uh, just like it says here, that this third battle would follow the same pattern in their mind as the previous two battles. And with the killing of the 30 men of Israel, Benjamin probably thought, so far so good, based upon what they were able to do before. So following their premeditated plan, the Israelites were successful in drawing the men of Gibeah out of the city. Okay? And so let's look at verse, go back and look at verse 33. So all the men of Israel, they, they, they kind of arm themselves, they get ready now. And so all the men of Israel rose from their place and put themselves in battle array at Baal Tamar. Then Israel's men in ambush burst forth from their position in the plain of Gibeah. 10,000 select men from all Israel came against Gibeah, and the battle was fierce. But the Benjamites did not know that disaster was upon them. And so these 10,000 soldiers, uh, Israelite soldiers, they came out of hiding, and then they advanced toward Gibeah. And now catch this now. Pretty basic stuff, but I want you to understand it as we follow here. The men of Gibeah, Gibeah were now caught between the two armies of Israel and didn't realize that disaster was about to strike. Okay. Let's draw an application here. Sometimes when we're involved in ungodly or sinful behavior, and maybe there has been a time in our lives that we had been in, involved in similar behavior and nothing happened to us. And then all of a sudden we, we, we got through it. And we're thinking all the time we're going through it. We think, oh gosh, I'm going to get caught. I'm going to get caught. I'm going to get chastised. But for some reason, this has happened with me, perhaps it's happened with you, Happened a lot of times with the guys at the mission where they do stuff and they don't get caught and they think, all right, you know, home free. But then all of a sudden, they start to get hemmed in. Hemmed in. And, and the Benjamites were hemmed in. They didn't realize it but they were now caught in between two army forces of the Israelites. You got that? And even though they're thinking, I'm good. Disaster is about ready to strike. Okay? And so, verses 35 and 36. Notice this. Well, the tail end of 34. But the Benjamites did not know that disaster was upon them. Verse 35. The Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel, and the children of Israel destroyed that day 25,100 Benjamites. All these drew the sword. So the, all of them were soldiers. So the children of Benjamin, Benjamin saw that they were defeated, and the men of Israel had given ground to the Benjamites because they relied on the men in ambush whom they had set against Gibeah. Now, ultimate source of victory was who? Was the Lord. So the Lord gave, defeated Benjamin, verse 35, the Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel. And the children of Israel destroyed that day 25,100 Benjamites, all these drew the sword. We got to realize that it's God that does this stuff. We had a graduation this last Wednesday. One of the fellows who, his name was Tony Craig. And Tony Craig, you know Tony, don't you, Perry? Tony Craig, if you've ever heard of the Craigs of, out of Alder Point, 
or the Wyatts out of Alder Point, or the Earlies out of Alder Point. They're all related. Tony's related to all of them. And they, most of his family said, there's no hope for Tony. He's the black sheep of the family, see. But Tony's marriage was just basket case. And he wound up at the mission. First day he came in, one of the first days he came in, I mean, he was upstairs for five days, four or five days, getting detoxed. He just couldn't function. He was an alcoholic. And I remember when he finally came down, we were taking him food up and stuff like that. And when he finally came down to the dining hall, and uh, I had an opportunity to talk to him, went over to the table, and the table was shaking, just like this, when he put his hands on it. And so I reached over and I, I grabbed his hands and got to know him and everything like this. And then in just a very short time, in just a, a few days, he gave his heart to the Lord. And he was just full of questions. He'd read his Bible and he'd say, so Tom, what's this mean? If one of the guys who'd been in the program for a while, if they'd come by where he was and studying the Bible, say, hey, can you answer this question? Well, I can't, but let's go see Chaplain Tom. And so they'd grab him and come into my office and sit down and close the door and ask me the question and we'd work him through it, see. Well, you fast forward a dozen months, and he graduates from the program, flying colors. And his wife and two daughters were there. And his youngest daughter sat up with him. I mean, those of you, don't miss a graduation. I'd love, I'd love to see you come up to a graduation. We have another one a week from this Wednesday. It starts at, uh, remember Zion, who came here in chair? Zion graduates. And um, he'd, he'd really be honored if, if, if you, you folks were there, if some of you folks were there. But Tony, I mean, we set the graduates in kind of an easy chair up there. And the guys, different ones, and family members and groups, and sometimes guests that, that aren't in the program, well, because they know the other guys will come in and, and speak a good word for and so. And Tony's youngest daughter, Abigail, sat right up beside him and they held hands as Tony graduated. Then his wife got up and shared, Tony's wife, and how God had restored their marriage. Jenna, the oldest daughter, didn't say a whole lot, but it was evident she was glad to have her dad back. See? And see, so that's, that's what happens when God gets a hold of people, gets hold of nations, gets hold of churches. And Tony when he got up to share, because we allow time for the graduates to get up and share, and sometimes they just preach, sometimes they share a little bit, but Tony says, I want to thank all the guys in the program that have been here and helped me since I've been here, and the staff, and, and the women's auxiliary, and he thanked for First Baptist Church Redway for sending the cards that, that, that come and everything, but he says, ultimately, all glory goes to God. Because all of you folks had a part, but God gets the glory, see. And that's what we need to remember. Sure, God used the Israelites to take care of this situation with the Benjamites. But it says, the Lord defeated the Lord. So then we have the destruction, I want to finish up with this, the destruction of the city of Gibeah. But I, let me make, I wrote this down early this morning. I want to make sure I mention it. The ultimate source of the victory was the Lord, who enabled Israel to strike down 25,100 Benjamites in that day. Thus, the Benjamites were judged for the sin of Gibeah. And then we have uh, from verse 37 to the end of the chapter, verse 48, the destruction of the city of Gibeah. And the general explanation, if you haven't read that, please read it. I hope, I hope you're reading this stuff as well, reading the, reading the scripture. You'll understand it better. You read it, and then as we share and, and uh, give you some insight, and then you'll have that. 
you'll, you'll have a head start on it if you've read it and looked at it a little bit. But the general explanation of the battle is given in verses 29 through 36. And then the specific details are given in verses 37 to 48. That's my way of information. And in verse 38, it says, Now the appointed signal between the men of Israel and the men in ambush was that they would make a great cloud of smoke rise up from the city. So when, just by way of explanation, when the men of Gibeah have been lured out into the open, the ambush party quickly invaded the city. And of course, entrance then would have been relatively simple because there were no one there. And so the Israelites slew the remaining inhabitants of the city and then they set the city on fire, setting up a great cloud of smoke. And the smoke was a prearranged signal for the main Israelite army. And so having, having feigned defeat or faked defeat, they now turned and pursued the men of Gibeah. You got that? So this was all a, a premeditated or a, a plan that was planned ahead. <clears throat> and then when the Benjamites saw that disaster threatened, they, they fled toward the desert. Verses, uh, chapter 20, verse, verse 42. Therefore, they turned their backs before the men of Israel in the direction of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them, and whoever came out of the cities, they destroyed in their midst. So, the Benjamites hoped to escape in this rugged area that they went to, but the Israelites pursued them and then killed 18,000 of them. And the surviving Benjamins fled toward the rock of Rimmon, but 5,000 were cut down along the road. And that's in those next few verses. And, and then while 2,000 more were struck down as the Israelites pr pursued them as far as a place called Gidim in verse 45. Verse 45. Then they turned, fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Rimmon, and they cut down 5,000 of them on the highways, then they pursued them relentlessly up to get them and killed 2,000, killed 2,000 of them. So the Rock of Rimmon provided a, a natural protection for the fugitives, for, for there were ravines, and people who have studied and, and looked at this area, they say there were ravines on, on the north, south, and west sides, and there were numerous caves in which the Benjamites could hide. So they went before, remember just a, a short time before, they were saying, yeah, we're good. Now they're heading into the caves and the ravines, you know, and they're, and, and they're scared. And so <clears throat> only 600 Benjamites remained alive, and these had hid at Rimmon for four months. Okay? And then in verse 48, And the men of Israel turned back against the children of Benjamin, struck them down with the edge of the sword from every city, men and beasts, all who were found. They also set fire to all the cities they came to or into. So since, and here's a little bit of a wrap up. Since the, Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin had failed to deliver the wicked men to the Israelites for judgment, the entire tribe of Benjamin experienced judgment as the men of Israel now devastated the tribe's territory by killing the inhabitants and cattle and then setting their cities on fire. In so doing, the Israelites carried out the demands of the Mosaic Law. And let me finish up by reading a few verses from the book of Deuteronomy. Listen closely. Listen closely. Deuteronomy chapter 13, beginning at verse 12. If you hear someone in one of your cities which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in, saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which you have not known. Then you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently. And that's just what the, 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 the Israelis wound up doing. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it, all that is in it, 
and its livestock with the edge of the sword. And then you shall gather all its plunder in the, into the middle of the street and completely burn with fire the city and all its plunder. For the Lord your God, you know, for the Lord your God. In other words, God, this is what you commanded us to do. It shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. So none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy, have compassion on you and multiply you just as he swore to your fathers. Because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God to keep all his commandments, which I command you today to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord your God. A sad thing, civil war that had to take place here. But yet the situation had to be dealt with. And it took a while for the Israelites to really get it together. They had to, 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 God allowed them to suffer some horrendous defeat in those first couple battles. But then when they really repented and offered the offerings that we mentioned earlier, then God said, okay, we're good. We're on the same page. Tomorrow, I'm going to give you victory. And that's just exactly what happened. Next week, you got to remember now, in, in future stuff, the tribe of Benjamin somehow survives. Because you see, you have Saul, King Saul, came from the tribe of Benjamin. You have the Apostle Paul, came from the tribe of Benjamin. See, So that tribe survived. And so next week, as we finish up, the book of Judges, we're going to talk about the preservation of the tribe of Benjamin. So read that chapter. It's a short chapter. shouldn't take you very long. So read that chapter and we'll talk about how Benjamin is preserved. And you see, it's a lesson to us. A couple things. When sin is prominent with us, we need to take care of it. We need to take care of it. And then, here's the neat thing about God and his mercy. Once the sin is taken care of, then God can again uh, start the process of restoration or preservation. And that's what he does with the tribe of Benjamin. With the wiping out and burning of the city of Gibeah, that took care of the judgment on the people of Gibeah for their sin. Now, the tribe needed to be preserved and the tribe needed of Benjamin needed to survive. We'll talk about that next week. What do you got? Chapter Welcome back, by the way. Chapter 15 of Acts. Chapter 15 of Acts. Ooh, good chapter. I love it. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your word. Thank you for bringing Pastor and Elva back safely to us. And we just ask that you bless Pastor as he shares this morning from Acts chapter 15. In Jesus' name, amen.